welcome to the WP Builds Podcast, bringing you the latest news from the WordPress community. Now, welcome your hosts, David Wormsley and Nathan Wrigley. Hello there and welcome once again to the WP Builds podcast. You have reached episode number 285, entitled Performance Testing During the Build. It was published on Thursday the 29th of June 2022. My name's Nathan Wrigley and a tiny bit of housekeeping just before we begin. I hope that last week you enjoyed the Page Builder Summit. If you were with us, I really appreciate it, whether or not you were a speaker, whether or not you helped out in some way, or just an attendee. Very, very nice to have you there. I hope that you enjoyed the event. It was certainly a lot of fun putting it on, and I do thank Anshin LaRue for all of the incredible hard work, and also Sunita in the Facebook group as well. If you're interested in the content that we put out at WP Builds, can I urge you to go to wpbuilds.com, browse around the website, but possibly the best place to go to would be the subscribe link, wpbuilds.com forward slash subscribe. Head over there and sign up to our newsletter and we'll keep you informed when we produce content. That's typically a podcast episode every Thursday. That's what you're listening to now, but also our This Week in WordPress show, which we produce live every Monday. Come and join in the fun. It's at wpbuilds.com forward slash live. Give us some comments, join in the chat, and then we repurpose that and it comes out on a Tuesday. So typically Tuesday and Thursday is when our content comes out. And if you go to the subscribe page, you can be kept up to date about that. Another thing I always mention is our deals page. I describe it as Black Friday, but every day of the week, go and check it out. Loads and loads of WordPress plugins, themes, blocks, all of that goodness, and with significant amounts off, it's sure to be a useful thing to bookmark. The WP Builds podcast was brought to you today by GoDaddy Pro. GoDaddy Pro, the home of managed WordPress hosting that includes free domain, SSL, and 24-7 support. Bundle that with The Hub by GoDaddy Pro to unlock more free benefits to manage multiple sites in one place, invoice clients, and get 30% off new purchases. You can find out more by going to go.me forward slash WP Builds. That's go.me forward slash WP Builds. And we really do thank GoDaddy Pro for helping to keep the WP Builds podcast going. Okay, what have we got on the podcast today? It's episode number 285 entitled Performance Testing During the Build. It's an episode with my good friend David Wormsley. We're in our WordPress Business Bootcamp series. This is series three episode three, and we are literally talking about that. Performance might be something that you just give a nod to. It might be something that you're very serious about. And on the podcast today, David and I talk about all of the different things that you may test and get into some of the things that you probably want to be avoiding, as well as some tools and tooling that you might find useful. I hope that you enjoy the podcast. Welcome to another in the Business Bootcamp series where we relearn everything we know about building WordPress sites and running a web design business from start to finish. We're on the third episode of season three where we're looking at the technical build and today we are discussing performance testing during the build. Nathan and I are taking contrasting approaches on getting our new businesses running and our first client's site built. She's a lawyer with no previous site called Miss A. And Nathan, as usual, shall we just recap on what we're doing? Yeah, I feel like I should pre-record this bit so that I can just press play and it's the same every time. Yeah, but nevertheless, here we go. So my approach is the traditional, what what might be called waterfall approach where, and this is probably the the, the approach that most people I think have still got, I would imagine. You Mm. go to the client, uh, somehow they get in touch with you, you agree to have some kind of meeting, you put a proposal out, you put a contract out, they sign it, the prices and everything is all agreed. You go away, do the work and the deadline is met, hopefully, and you hand the website over and then you've got to think about another website. Yeah, 
And uh, I'm going the agile approach, which is a, a kind of contrast to the build it and they will come approach. That is the traditional approach. And here we're trying to build a minimal viable website, which will do ongoing improvements in collaboration with the client. So it's much more strategic and data driven and ongoing. Nice. Yeah. So so there we go. That's the background. Mm. And this time it's all about performance testing during the build. Yes. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, so we're primarily thinking about the uh, front and back end technical performance stuff, but I think we'll also just touch a little bit on some of the design technical issues as well. So, shall we describe the problem a little bit? With yeah, this okay. One? Because well, you, you kick well, it off, and then I'll I'll fire in. Yeah. Well, in the early days, um, and I'm still learning from this, you know, we kind of build stuff without thinking, particularly of performance issues, and you know, be new to WordPress. Um, you, you can introduce so many plugins which you can do wonderful things for you like e-commerce and membership, learning management systems, but they, they do, are a drain on your server and you may not be aware of that. You may not be aware how it might perform when you've got concurrent users on that platform. So all these kind of things have tripped me up in the past. Have they tripped you up at all? Um, a little bit here and there, but generally speaking, my work was much more modest you know I certainly didn't get into learning management systems nobody was ever looking for that but I I did yeah. did a, a few times things like real estate sites where there was hundreds of properties and they were being changed all the time and you know the clients didn't know about deleting things and so storage space ran out and the performance of carrying out faceted search and all of those kind of things so yes a little bit but possibly not as much as you. And also when you were using WordPress, looking at things, maybe you'll mention this in a minute, you know, theme forest, mega themes. Mm. I think I managed to dodge that bullet a bit because yes. I'd all, you know, everybody was already talking about the fact that these themes are probably not what most people ought to be using as a pro. They're not the best building block to start from. Yeah, I see this um, with a lot of DIY new people to WordPress. They made the mistake I did way back um, and that was I with my own it wasn't a client site <laughs> thankfully and I realized the mistake early on but I got a theme forest mega theme for e-commerce and it was wonderful it did everything I expected but you know I realized how slow it was in the back end and if we'd have had a lot of traffic going to that um, because it's a dynamic system where people needed to add to the cart and go through the checkout which couldn't be cached and I see a lot of people kind of expecting endless you know they're on shared hosting they don't know anything else they've been sold the the products that are out there that can do things they just don't realize the consequences and since then i've been really mindful i mean i went back to back then to genesis of a slim theme and did more manually but ever since i've been quite conscious of what plugins i add in and what kind of ram they might use up um just kind of predict it really for my own business really just mm. because of the fact that i i make money out of selling the hosting and you know i have to pay for the servers so if i can reduce down to you know keep it as simple as possible then i will so there's a couple of things i guess to add in here and the first one is that because wordpress is a bit wild west in that you can get anything yeah. from anywhere and plug it into your wordpress website there's no real there's no real impediment to any developer of themes let's let's go for themes to begin with mm. let's say these mega themes just sort of claiming that it's performant you know it yeah. would be easy for them to stick that on the advertising materials you know high performing wordpress theme does everything so that's the first bit and the second mm. bit is there was no thought back then really about all of this you know it didn't really matter if your site was slow because 10 years ago that th there was no kind of google getting on your back and saying look if your site is performing slowly you will lose in the rankings game there was none of that so it was just you know you had to wait and I also think people were a bit more forgiving back then yeah. what I mean is casual mm. users of the internet straying onto any site the internet was a bit newer and there was an expectation that oh it's taking a little while to load but never mind but I think yeah. as the internet has gone on We've drawn. We've become more and more obsessed with speed to the point now where I think really, if you don't load something within the first couple of seconds, you're out of the game. The the typical internet user now is so used to things being almost immediate that some yes. part of their psychology kicks in and says, "No, go <laughs> to the next thing. That's not good enough." 
So there's all of those different pieces in the puzzle um, as well. And uh, one one other thing I would say is that as a casual user, there there really isn't any information out there to let you know that these heavyweight plugins that are doing incredibly complicated things. I mean, just take the take the example of LM, an LMS. You've got mm-hmm. you know payment, you've got paywalls, you've got different courses. They're all lumped into you know under different umbrellas, and you've got different parts of each of those courses. And you might have badges. It's mm-hmm. a lot. There's a lot yeah. going on. And a typical user will just see, well, I've got WordPress. I bought a plugin. I've paid for it, and I've paid for hosting it should now all just fit together. Surely that's how it works. So I think there's quite a bit of messaging that needs to happen for the typical user about performance, which never, ever gets talked about. You know, and the first experience on WordPress might be a really dreadful one just because you've installed these things and then you're thinking, well, why why is it taking five seconds to do anything? That's no good. Yeah, no, we're still quite obsessed with... And it will be true with a lot of plugins and page builders and, and themes are uh, very keen to be performant now because we're all aware of it because of the new drive with Google. But it tends to concentrate on the output. And that's fine right. if you've got a static site. But if you've got a dynamic one where you can't cache the output, um, that's when you have issues. And also, I think also when I'm considering a build, I'm... I'm having to consider a little bit how much the client is likely to be in there doing things. So with an e-commerce mm. site, chances are they're going to be in there checking their orders and doing things in the back end using you know some of the server resources where my static site clients will hardly ever be changing anything going in the back and using up resources. So yeah. I've become very conscious of that. I think it's quite interesting that Google, it feels like it was about two years ago, let's say it was something like that, yeah. started to bang this gong about performance and the hit that you might get in the search engine results pages. And I think I think that message is getting in because certainly in the communities that you and I frequent, it's, I feel it's died down a little bit, for, but for a very mm. long period of time, that was the main thrust of everybody's conversation was how to how to drive performance so that you know everybody was talking about squashing images and minifying yeah. css and also thinking about the time to first bite and all of these different things those conversations had never happened maybe it's just part of the vernacular now everybody realizes so it feels like those conversations have kind of gone away a little bit but there definitely has been a sea change and the wordpress core team has now got a performance team and the intention is to shave what they can out of core that doesn't really need to be there i mean my experience of a vanilla wordpress website is that it is blazingly fast but there's obviously things in the underpinning architecture that they feel can be addressed and tweaked and i think conversations with hosting companies are going to be taking place so it's not just going to be about changing the the core of WordPress and getting as few queries out at the same moment as possible. But I think they've they've got the remit also of going out, having a chat with hosting companies and making sure that they know that things work better on, let's say, PHP uh, 8 over 7 and that, that all of these things are sold to their customers and reliably informed to their customers and yeah. just generally make it so that the, that piece is fixed as well. Um, it's really difficult, I think, with this kind of conversation to get the priorities right. And that, right. that's what I've been trying to adjust all the time. I remember in the early days knowing about the dig effect, that popular social oh, sharing boy. platform, yeah. where so many sites went down because they were on shared hosting. Suddenly, because they were popular on dig, lots of people were visiting and the sites went down. I was aware from, of that from the very early days and that. But... Often you hear conversations where people say about performance and that, and the first thing somebody says is you need better hosting. Right. And so often it's not the case. If you've got good caching, your hosting probably won't make much of a difference, you know. And there's so much it depends, you know, um, when it comes to performance. I, um, I feel I feel this is a really difficult conversation to have. So, so imagine that we're talking to Miss A. I yeah. don't think I don't think this conversation is ever really going to crop up. This is something that we're going to insulate yeah. clients from. Would you say that's true? I mean, do you ever get into this with your clients or do you just tell them that you're going to do some things to make it performant and that's the end of that? 
Yeah, I think I've probably found my way around using on static sites, my page builder and getting a good performance now. So it's not a conversation I would have. But I guess if it came to somebody needing a, a platform learning management system or something like that, then I think it would have to be one of the first conversations. Because right, there, right. there, there comes a point where when you might have an expected number of concurrent users that I think it might be more cost effective to go with a third party than WordPress, you know? And so, what, so with your websites, are you still using? Let's let's okay. Let's drill down into your best practice at the moment because I'm always intrigued by what you're doing. Let's say that I come to you. I am equivalent to Miss A. I'm not very technical, and I just want you to build me a five page site. It's got a contact form, but other than that, the, there's no blog, no nothing. It's just content which will never change, particularly over time. What, what is the what's the build in the background going to look like for you? I know you're probably going to use Beaver Builder, but what caching are you going to use? Where are you? Where, which hosting company are you going to go with and so on? Yeah, well, I mean, DigitalOcean is the hosting I have, yep. so I yep. get control over the, the size of the server. And, and actually, that's an interesting thing because when new clients are coming now, I am quite interested to know what type of traffic they will have. And it it does vary. So there are, you know, there's a site now which will be getting much more traffic because it's events-based and it happens in the summer. There's an e-commerce site that gets busy in the run-up to Christmas. There's some sites which are really only visited because they're business to business, nine to five in, you know, uh, in the working week. And knowing all that now allows me to monitor the server and expect, you know, when somebody's coming to me, I think, where, which server I can put them on, where they will fit in. So I will consider that. But now I've obviously, this is, a, you know, a chat for performance really, but I've I've learned which things to cut out myself to to get the best sort of performance on static sites. Now. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, okay. So, so yeah. If, the, if, if, sorry to interrupt you, but if you're on hmm. that DigitalOcean droplet and let's say, for example, that the client phones you up and, and, and they say, I've got an event, it's launching in three weeks' time and we are really anticipating a ton of traffic. Yeah. Are you then backing up that site, migrating that site to a different droplet, which you, uh, you, you know, it, it's better prepared, shall we say, to handle all of that? I guess I would be prepared yeah, for that, but it's yeah. never happened. No. Um, you know, it's been pretty regulated, but it is something to think about, I think. And there are other things I think, well, sorry, we're not even talking about what other things we should test. I mean, there is things that we probably, I didn't used to do and I would do more now these days, plug-in compatibilities, I would debug things, I would sit, put that on in WordPress so I can tell if errors are coming up. Right. And, and PHP versions, JavaScript errors I should look for in the browser, that kind of thing, as well as all of this concerns over perhaps concurrent users on a dynamic platform. So all of these things are things that I've learned to be aware of over the years. Yeah, it's kind of interesting, isn't it? Because you just rattled off a laundry list there and each one of the things that you just mentioned there's quite a lot of learning in all of those. And one of the principles of this entire series is that we're relearning everything. So there is a ton of things that need to be learned there. You know, you could spend your entire life just browsing through hosting companies and trying to figure that out. But then you could spend your entire life just concentrating on caching. You could spend yeah. your entire life thinking about whether you want to go headless or not. You could spend your entire life comparing LMSs and seeing which one, which yes. one is most performant. So... From the point of view of a, a newbie into the game of building WordPress websites, this this is a lot that you're probably going to have to saddle for yourself and not really communicate too much of it to your client. There's a couple of, I mean, there's things that I never used to do that I've only done, I would say, over the last year or so, which is turning on debugging, you right. know, actually putting that script in there in WordPress so it tells me if there's an issue. Um, and that's quite good. There's, there is an online service which is quite useful if you're careful with it and that's called uh, wp hive so if you're auditioning plugins that are on the repository this website which comes with an extension as well a chrome extension will give you some basic figures from their own tests on plugins that are on the repository so it will tell you how much ram they use whether there's any javascript or php errors with their run of tests but you have to be very careful with reading it because it's an automatic test. What it does is it it runs it and it shows how the figures would be before this plugin has been activated. And it gives off a lot of 
uh, false information, false positives about errors. Um, sometimes that will happen because you it may be a plugin that needs another plugin to be installed to be active, you know, so it's going to, you know, chuck out an error. But it's a really useful um, site if you want to just kind of see, particularly for me these days, to see which plugins are using up more server resources over time because you can look on previous versions. Right. So, okay, so this is WP Hive, and you can find that yep. at WPHive.com. I'll put the link in the show notes. And just to be clear, it's taking... So is their approach that they, they throw up a vanilla version of WordPress, stick a plugin in it, and then run some tests and see what comes out the other end and then publish those in a way so that you can compare, let's say, LMS plugins. They'll just take the work, the repository version of a plugin and compare it to the other repository versions as well. Yeah, you can compare, but it's running its own automatic test on their own server. Got it. And it runs tests to measure, has little benchmarks on different back-end pages and front-end pages, and then tells you what the difference is before the plugin was activated and after it was activated. And you, it's quite good, but in you can do a comparison. So you can take, say, one plugin against another competitor and get an overall score. But I think it would be unwise to do that because, say, something like RAM use, which is the thing that I find most interesting on it, it gives you an overall view. So it will measure lots of different pages. So... Um, you know, you could find that it's got a block on, say, something like the writings options PHP page, which you're not interested in. Yeah. Um, yeah. Bringing down the total sum. So you you really have to treat the information there, look at it holistically to see, you know, because if on a particular admin page it uses up a lot of resources, but that's not one that's going to be used by you, by your visitors, by your um, clients who go in, it's probably not relevant. So you still have to decipher, but it's a really useful tool just to get a, an idea of which plugins are quite heavy. Yeah, this is fascinating because I've just, I won't mention the names, but I've just put in two plugins, which basically mm. purport to do a very similar thing. And mm. and it, so it, it's giving me a whole load of metrics about memory usage. So it's, it's polling yeah. the front page and telling me what's going on there. And then it's polling a bunch of things in the WP admin. So you mentioned options mm. dash writing, but there's index.php and so on. And it tells me what the amount of memory usage is for those. Then it runs a page speed test on the front mm. page and then the same admin pages. Like I said, there's about 10 of them. And then it's showing me a whole bunch of other criteria. So the impact on memory usage, the impact on page speed, any PHP errors, JavaScript issues, and so on. So it's really very cool. I like this. Yeah. And I've never used it before in my life. But I think you do have to be careful because I right. did do my own tests with it. Because okay. uh, particularly with the false positives, I, I put debug on and installed the plugins myself to see if they kicked out the same errors as they mm. were recording. And it was not always the case. In fact, more often than not, it wasn't the case. So you have to take that with a grain of salt. But generally, the RAM use, which is what I'm quite interested in, um, is is pretty true, but yeah, again, you can't take the top level score. You have to really look at where they, where the RAM use is going. Um, yeah, yeah, that's interesting because so, it, it's not it's not perfectly reliable, but at least it's some kind of uh, yeah. some data for free. Yeah, this is great. So that's wphive.com. Definitely worth checking out, and uh, especially in this mode that I'm using, I like the comparison mode. That's cool. Yeah, and the tool I use just to check that is the one that I put in most of the time on my sites, which is one called Usage DD. Yeah, and it's it just gives you a very very simple measure of RAM use on the individual pages you're on. And what I like about it, there is another more advanced tool, Query Monitor, which has been around for a long time. Yeah, but this Usage DD is very lightweight compared to that, and also it allows you to see when you're in a page builder editor mode, what is being used when you go into that. So so that might be more interesting now, um, particularly, I, I guess, if you're using one of the uh, block editors that goes, you know, builds on Gutenberg, because you've got the Gutenberg there, and you've also got what they increase on that when you're in the editor mode. And if you've got clients, say, going in there a lot, then that might be relevant. I've just seen that you've done a YouTube video about usage DD as well. Yeah, yeah, ages ago, yeah. yeah. So it's just so simple, and just to have it on all the time um, is great. And it, I think it only shows if you're an admin, so you could leave it in there if your clients have an editor role. And it just gives you that basic idea about, you know, 
uh, it's been useful for me. It's made me cut down or think about the plugins that I, w- I would install. So wh- it where does it show? And we all know that you use Beaver Builder. How is it showing that? Is it just adding something to the sort of the the equivalent of a, the admin bar at the top in BB? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it does it on the footer actually. So oh, okay. it just puts a little overlay on the footer, tiny little bar with just four metrics on it, which you learn what they are. So it's right. the it's the page load, it's the RAM use on that uh, particular page. So and it can be quite interesting. I've just had a client actually who's sort of building their own website with me that I've built sites with them and they they believe they can build this. It's, it's all politics. Somebody in there wants to build it, so they're doing it. But it's really interesting because for the first time ever, I've had to increase the RAM, the, the RAM that they allowed on this static site to one gigabyte never had to this is kind of four times the size that i've ever needed to go to on any site before because they're adding so much into the custom products page that i've set them you know so it's it's quite revealing having that kind of stuff so yeah i was was going to ask what you know typically you throw this thing in and and i know kind of what i'm like i'll look at that data and yeah. it, I literally look at it, but whether or not it would compel me to do anything, you know, unless it was seriously alarming. Do you do you get meaningful conclusions from it? You know, now that you've been using, say, usage DD for long enough, presumably you'll you'll notice, oh, that's weird. That's higher than I've ever seen it before. I need to take some action. And does it does it help you? Does it propel you forward in thinking what you need to do to fix the problems? Yeah, it, it, yeah. it kind of guides me like this issue where this one particular page i mean it's just this custom post type that i created products and the, and what they've been putting in there because see it's increased through that but also there are things where i've reevaluated things so i by default i always used to use gravity forms i've used it forever it's a great plugin but it is quite a heavy plugin and sometimes on many of the sites that i've I have all they need is the page builder one, a very simple one. Yeah. So looking at that makes me think, oh, I'll just move that out. Suddenly I've got more RAM. Well, why didn't I do this before? Right. You know, just habits, right. you know. Yeah. So it confronts you with things that need to be done, but not in an alarming way. That's great. I love that. And I've never used that one either. Yeah. Oh, okay. It's good. So it's all pretty new stuff for me. So, um, yeah. So I, I've got into more, I, I think. Query monitor is quite good for picking up on those kind of uh, JavaScript errors where usage DD wouldn't do that. So that's maybe useful. But yeah. turning on debug is a good thing. Mm. What about um, browser? Do you do any sort of browser testing while you're building? Do you know, it's interesting because the in do you remember the olden days where this was utterly crucial? In fact, it was in my contracts and proposals that I would test in a range of browsers. And I used to enumerate them. So it would literally say that we would test in Internet Explorer version 5, 6, 7, whatever we were at at the time, Firefox, Safari, Opera. That was still a player at the time. Um, Google Chrome back in the day didn't exist. But then, then it kind of all died away and Chrome kind of took over the world. And so usually now... Um, I'll just have a look in Chrome and Chromium-based browsers and then throw it in Firefox. And it's so rare now with the tools that I use, you know, page builders and so on. It's so rare that anything looks even remotely different. I mean, it might by a pixel be slightly different, but there's very little work to be done. But you'll you'll remember the days yeah. of Internet Explorer 6 where that was <laughs> it was completely not the case. We had two utterly different views if you looked at it in firefox and you looked at it in internet explorer 6 they were totally different yeah you know things like the the fact that pngs were not transparent and so on this was a this a really big deal and i remember the day first for the first time putting into my contract that we will not support internet explorer 6 and thinking this will be a nightmare (laughs) nobody's going to sign this contract and nobody seemed to care so it was fine and the world moved on yeah, and you don't, I don't think many, well, I don't know, I don't see other people's contracts, but I remember the early contract killer, uh, and it's still there, the same one you can build from, that Andy Clark's uh, open source contract that you can use. And it's still, I looked at it quite recently, and it's still kind of stuck in that era, uh, talking about what browsers you will support. It's yeah. never been something that I've felt I've needed to talk about, but maybe sometimes it comes back to to haunt me and it's usually right, because right. the 
uh, the director of the company who I haven't been dealing with uses something like uh, I had a situation where we'd finished all our work and then the, the, the director had come and looked at it and he used IE 11 which had a particular bug just at that time oh. it was an IE 11 problem and I had to find this solution to just appease this one person because they were using a browser with a bug you know and uh, also, I've, there's been another situation quite recently where we're having to sort of really think about the display because the main person who does it looks on an iPad. Now, oh, the yeah. usage figures yeah. for iPad for them is about 1%. And the amount of work that's going into making it look good for this 1% of people, you know. I think is... I think these days the, the metric really, my, my understanding of the, the browser community really is that on the desktop, Chrome or yeah. Chromium, really yeah. wins so that's where most of your effort needs to go things like firefox seem to be declining um and but you've really got to worry about the mobile landscape because yes nobody's nobody that's using android is using safari but everybody that's using ios well not everybody because you can yeah. get chrome but i think most people who are using ios which in places like north america is the dominant mobile phone platform they're going to be using safari and so there is a lot of you know probably quite a great need and i i've i've had i've, I've dabbled with browsers that claim to show what it looks like on those things but i've never been able to categorically say whether they do or not the only point of reference is when a client comes to me and says it doesn't work and i say screenshot it and that's all yes. i've got because i'm certainly not going to be go out and buy the latest iphone just to test yeah. it. Have you ever come across like developer type browsers? Like I believe there's one called Blisk. I think it's Blisk, which um, enables yeah. you to to sort of show all the different permutations of browsers. I could have the name of that product wrong. Um, and it'll show you what it's going to look like on iOS 7 and what it's going to look like on Android and what it's going to look like on this, that, and the other. It's a bit like Litmus for email, but it's in built into a browser. Is it... Does it work in the same way as something like Hoverify, where you just, or actually, I think Firefox has it natively, where you can show the different displays because it's just showing you the resolutions? Or is this actually going out to a device? Yeah, so uh, I, I'm not really sure about that, but I'm going to read you their pitch off their website. So I, I, I've got mm. the right product name. It's called Blisk, B L I S K. And it says, okay. used globally from the freelance segment to the enterprise level, Blisk helps web developers, quality insurance, blah, 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 blah test modern web applications in half the time. And then it's got a screenshot of exactly what I was describing. They're showing the same website in a multitude of browsers, but I do not know how they're rendering that, um, whether or not right. it is truly going out to a browser or if it's just some kind of rendering engine. But um, but that would certainly save me a lot of time, but I, I haven't been using it lately, anything like that. Ooh. I have to look into it because I have signed up for every kind of free testing tool not that I do it this is not something i do as i'm building generally but something like browser stack and lambda test those services which actually you you put in and it goes out to a server that actually shows you the display in that actual device on yeah. that operating system but i mean that's really you know i can't imagine miss a is ever going to pay for us to do that kind of level of uh, testing you know no i really don't think she would but it would be quite curious you know, to know what she's using, because if mm. if she's looking at the website through an iOS browser and we fail, then as far as she's concerned, we failed. You know, it's a disaster. Yeah. The whole website's a mess and we might need to explain ourselves a little bit. This does look good. I do like the the all, all the things that are on offer there, but I, the, unfortunately, I can't tell you how it's figuring this stuff out. I'm kind of hoping that it's actually generating it from... A, a device itself, but I doubt it. I imagine it's just some sort of rendering engine based upon the, the widths and mm. so on, but I'm not sure. There are lots of tools out there, lots of free websites as well, which will kind of display for responsiveness your sites. And I would like to say that I do that quite regularly when I'm building just to check things, but only today I shared a link with somebody and they came back and said, just wanted to spot little error there and at 320 pixels wide, something oh. was leaking out. So I know that I, I'm not always perfect on that but it is something that i've now 
started to do more regularly. Hoverify has been the thing that I go to very quickly to just... Yeah, so Hoverify is a Chrome extension or an extension Mm. for a browser which enables you to do, oh, a whole bunch. It's ever so good, isn't it? But uh, it allows you to inspect, um, choose a color picker. You can also, with the click of a button, get to any asset that's on the page, so images and so on and so forth. And it also allows you to, to sort of change the responsiveness. So it does what we just said, but the fact yeah. that it's a the fact that it's a browser, I'm I'm pretty sure means that it's it's not rendering it from a device. It's just using the uh, the viewport. But um, yeah, I think Hoverify is a pretty pretty good thing. But the yeah, that's as much there's, as I've got to say on that. Yeah, there's no there's no shortage of free tools as well that do that and and similar products. There is the on the other side, and what Hoverify doesn't do for me is the opposite, where you get the kind of 4K monitors now. And um, with a lot of the, this is something which I've only kind of really cottoned on to recently is that I do a lot of full width displays and mm. realize just how awful they looked, as you know, because you've got a big monitor now. <laughs> yes. Um, if, you, if you've yes. got some contained content and then you've got some full width content, it can look shockingly bad. It, it uh, really is interesting. I've got this, I've got a fairly wide browser. It's not like a 4K monitor, sorry, monitor. Mm-hmm. It's not like a 4K one. You know, the pixel density is not particularly mm-hmm. high, but it is quite wide. And websites just look so strange when you put it into full width mode. I mean, genuinely, I've got as much space. So let's imagine that a typical website is, I don't know, let's let's go for 1280 pixels, something like that would maybe be the, mm. the maximum I would use. There's about as much white space on both sides as on each side, I should say, as there yeah. is of the website. So imagine you're looking at a normal website, you've got a third blank, and then in the middle you've got the content, and then you've got another third blank on the edge. And it does look really weird, but I don't know how to overcome that. The... The thing I think which you do is to is to add a container to make it look like I don't know that at least there's something encapsulating the whole website and and it's not just sort of drifting off into empty space. Yeah, that's become my standard is to stick a, a class on the body or the HTML yeah. so I contain it to up to nineteen twenty pixels. Where looking right. at the kind of latest figures, most people fall under that. So. Those people who fall under it will see the design as full width, but then after that, they're contained. I mean, it could be higher. That's another interesting element to this as well. You constantly have to keep looking and readjusting how you're designing to certain widths, depending on how browsers are changing. So it's something, That's right. again, yeah. you have to keep monitoring. Yeah. Um, I, I back feel in those early days, can you yeah. remember when the, the IE6, everything was really 800 by 600 pixels That's high. Right. Wasn't it? I had forgotten all about that. Well, that was the typical monitor size, wasn't it? I, yeah. I, I think nobody's really looking at a browser in that way. I mean, the intention, I think, of having a, a larger monitor is that you've really got two or three windows open at the same time so it was a bit of a bit of a fake comparison i just made there realistically i'm using up half the screen for the monitors for the browser and the other half might have i don't know slack open or something like that so i never really experienced that but it is it is kind of weird um but yeah yeah do you just add some sort of drop shadow a little bit of a drop shadow to the body class and yeah okay just to get a, a feeling of a page like it's floating a bit higher got it yeah, I have this standard kind of grey, really, and a bit that's of a right. drop shadow, and that's it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but it, it is interesting. I suppose one thing that we will save, I think, for later debate when we talk about legal is accessibility. That's something, again, which is a sort of ongoing design testing, um, you know, particularly these days, picking the right colours. I used to be terrible for picking colours, which, given there's a really high number of men with uh, some kind of visual impairment, you know, it's quite important to do this, something I never used to do. So I think that's growing, but we'll talk about that, I think, later. Yeah, the whole accessibility thing doesn't generally, I think, come under the performance remit, does it? But certainly, certainly very important to look at. Um, at well, some point. another uh, episode. Yeah, I mean, I think certainly for testing, I mean, uh, you know, never until about a year ago would I have got out a screen reader and actually <laughs> tested it. <laughs> Yep. on one of my sites and yep. it's you know it can be quite horrific really well it's a hot topic at the minute isn't it it's kind of replaced for me at least anyway in my feed of yeah. information about wordpress and websites accessibility is kind of replaced core web vitals as the thing everybody's talking about i don't think we've got much to talk about now we could just do a bit of a 
rundown of the testing tools that are available. We've mentioned most of these, I yeah, think. Yeah, perfect. I mean, obviously, the, the key one, which I didn't used to use, and I feel more proficient in these days, is the inspector tools using Chrome Inspector to see what's going on, whether there's any errors there. And it's got, I think, one of the key testing tools now. It's got Lighthouse by yeah. Google inbuilt, hasn't it? So you oh, that's brilliant. Yep. Yeah, SEO as at the same time, the best practice. And um, what did I miss on that one? I, I don't know, before, but I, I agree with you. I, I'm constantly looking yeah. at that lighthouse thing, uh, a bit obsessively, yeah. actually. But another one that you got me onto, which carries out a similar uh, test, yes. is the Speed Vitals website, yes. which uh, you you go there, you punch in your URL, pick a pick a destination, um, and it runs a whole bunch of sp- Speed Vital tests. You know, it figures out the time to first bite and last. Uh, sorry last contentful yeah. paint and all of that kind of stuff. And um, it's really great. And it does it all almost immediately. You have to wait um, seconds, really. Yeah. And then it gives you a, a full report. It's totally free. Maybe there's a maybe there's a way of giving them some money for more of a more of an in-depth analysis. I don't know, but it's been useful for me. Yeah, I found it very useful just to be able to kind of see the waterfall, which because the, I often find with the lighthouse stuff, there's not all the information I like. So I do like from GT Metrics, the waterfall. You've got that now in the Speed Vitals. And also what I like is that you can um, you can simulate a range of different devices and different right, speeds right. and different, and you can go from different countries as well, which can, was something we haven't spoken about here, but it's another consideration when you're building the sites is where your server is in relation to the audience as well. Oh um, yeah, whether you've which, got a CDN switched on or not and yeah, where, the, yeah. where the box is. I'm guessing in your case, being a DigitalOcean customer and usually yeah. building sites for UK businesses, you're just yeah. always picking the London Ge- geography yeah absolutely yeah, okay. uh, london server does it and to be honest i would probably lose performance for having a, a cdn because chances are that that local <laughs> uh, server that goes that would serve them would be further away than the one that they're already going to so yes yeah that's an interesting generally, point yeah. Yeah. yeah i mean you can lose out can't you with cdns everybody says it's great for performance and it can be if you're serving an international audience but if you're not it can work against you sometimes yeah that's a good point though that you've got to think about what the you know where the business is you're lucky i guess in that pretty much all of your business uh it lands in the uk that was always the same for me i never had Mm. to build a website for anybody else i don't think other than a a uk um uh, business so that decision was always fairly straightforward but if you're building something which is international in scope this this starts to become really important there's another little tool which isn't really for that purpose, which is Microsoft's Clarity, which is a tool which gives you some basic analytics, but it also is a kind of measure of experience testing. So it, um, if you set it up, it's pretty much like any any of these things. You just put in a script in your header code, and then it starts to measure, record individual people's journey through your site. And although it's not while we're building, generally it's something for that. It's really for getting heat maps and recording and seeing where there's problems, where there might be dead links on your site. Uh, it's got some basic measures in it, rage clicks and quick backs, whether somebody's going to a page and not getting what they expect and return. So it gives you those measurements. But I actually find it now quite useful while I've just been building sites to have it on early, recording my own clients uh, going through it because I can actually see how they're interacting with the site as well. So is it a bit like Hotjar? Um, yes. In that it's it's creating a little heat map and it's tracking the mouse and you can replay a video of what the mouse was doing at any given moment. Yes, and it's just, yeah. it's just wonderful. And you can see, you know, I, I was watching my own client go in there on their mobile looking at the site and I can see them pinching out as well, you know, to, to expand the size of the text in certain areas. It just, just in an, a bit of early... Because there isn't the money, the budget to put forward the idea of doing some proper user testing, it's quite useful just to see somebody else going through your site. How um, do you how do you differentiate them from you? I mean, obviously you know what you did. But yes. How, how would well, you? Well, I can ex- okay. I can exclude my own IP. Ah, great. And I can exclude okay. theirs, yeah. um, but uh, I don't in the first place, just so I can see. And it becomes pretty obvious that it gives you something on the location and the device they're using. And if it doesn't match yours, you know if there's only two of you on it. So, so it sounds like fun, 
But what yeah. are you what are you actually getting out of it? Do you do you get I mean you described that you could see them pinching and zooming and all of those kind of things. Have you have you yet had a, a real revelation moment where they've done something you've gone, ah, wow, that's not what I thought anybody would do. You know, something where you thought this is this is gold. They completely failed at what I thought was obvious. Um, not so bad. I'll tell you what is quite interesting because you can see them, it actually is recording them in the page builder editor. Not that I've learned uh-huh. anything from this, but it is quite interesting to see where someone's moving around and clicking around just to give you some idea about how lost or not they are. But yeah, no, I haven't. It's too new for me to really get anything, but I just do think it might be you know, a quick way of getting a little bit of user testing. So uh, as I've seen on one of the ones that I designed, somebody was clicking on something they thought was clickable that wasn't. And how many times have you been to a website where you think something should be clickable? Everything indicates you should be able to go to somewhere and it's not. It's well, that's, just an image. that's quite interesting. That is that is properly yeah. meaningful data, isn't it? Because all of a sudden that needs to be a button or it needs to be changed so that it doesn't look in or dis- is not described in any way like something that you can click. Does it... Right, sorry, we're drilling into this clarity <laughs> thing, which wasn't ever the intention, but I've, I've got a question. Does it, um, does it chart the waterfall? So does it show what it looked like from moment to moment, or does it just show a background image of the page as it was when the DOM was fully loaded? In other words, would it show that users are getting ticked off because things are not loading? Um, it will it will measure somebody going from page to page in the one session. Uh-huh, uh-huh. It will list all of the... Uh, well, not all of the events, because it's not as, you know, it's not as complex as some of the tools out there. It's kept very basic. But you you can skip inactivity and you can see, but there are some sort of little caveats with it where if they're inactive for more than 10 minutes, it stops with their recording and things like that. So you might not get a full picture. Okay. But yes, you can zoom down to anything, you know. So on the on its um, interface, it, it has some of these things like dead clicks or rage clicks where someone's clicking and then you can go and you find a percentage of those. Then you can go to the recordings where rage clicks have been shown. And then when you're in that recording, you can zoom down and just find where they were rage clicking. So you can <laughs> see what was going on at that point. So you can drill quite a lot. It's Anyway, it's not really, actually, it's, it's not really a tool for this. And we'll probably end up talking about it again yeah. after the build. But it's but called Clarity I, and it's free, right? It's a Microsoft it's thing and it's totally free. Oh, that's fascinating. Yeah, yeah, and it doesn't slow your website down. It's just, uh, I think it's a phenomenal. I'm surprised more people aren't using it. I'm, I'm really it. surprised that it doesn't slow the website down as well because you'd imagine yeah. it's the, you know it's phoning home more or less constantly. So that's yeah. that's interesting. I wonder how they managed to pull that off. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so what else have we got? We've got a load of tools. We talked about yeah. browsers. Oh, I've got something to add about browsers, if you've got a minute. Yeah. Just bear in mind that the more extensions that you throw into your browser, the less performant any website is. So as an example... I've got several things on my web on my in my browser. One of which is a thing called uBlock Origin, and uBlock Origin is designed yes. to stop nastiness happening and for third-party scripts to get blocked. Now, mm. these kind of things can have a real impact not only in the visual display of the website, but they also inject things into the DOM. So, mm. you know, it might be that Miss A has over the years filled her browser with weirdness and <laughs> some of the things might be slowing things down a perfect example is is my f- parents my father has a browser and it's just loaded with stuff he's obviously at some point clicked agreed to download a browser extension but he probably has no idea of how to get rid of it and there's dozens and dozens of them and every so often i go and expunge them they all seem to creep back in slowly over time. And things really do speed up. So the performance of the website, even if they're looking at it in the same browser as you, they may be getting a, a modestly different experience because of all the different extensions that are in some way interacting and interfering with the website. Yeah, I wish there was a way of being able to... I would love to know. I mean, in some ways, Clarity will give me some information about the type of device that my client's using at that point when I've got it in earlier. And there used to be other tools that would do that, that, which I don't no longer use, that would um, be there for giving feedback that would tell you 
what device somebody's been having. But it's just a shame you can't... I don't think you can get that information, can you? I think you uh, used to be able to get that information because... Do you remember when there was all the brouhaha about uh, fingerprinting? So even right. if you didn't have cookies, mm. companies like Facebook could figure out that you were a unique user. In other words, who you were because of a combination of things. And I'm pretty sure that one of them was all the extensions that you had because it's quite oh. likely that your combination of extensions is unique to you. Well, not necessarily unique, but when combined with another bit of data like your IP address, it probably is David. You know, we're probably looking <laughs> at David now. So I know that that information used to leach out, but whether or not the brouhaha about fingerprinting made it that Chrome et al. no longer gave that information away, I don't know. Mm, interesting. You will be pleased to know that I installed one of your extensions today, an extension called Extension Manager, yes. which allows me to turn off those extensions. This is a great one, actually, just very briefly to tackle the problem of extension overload. Basically, it allows you with one button to get rid of all extensions, just switch them all off. Or you can set up a, a little default, I don't know, web development palette of extensions and you click the button and all of those become active and so on. So you can have different scenarios. It's pretty good. It's free. It works. Yeah. And I think uh, testing tools, there's so many out there. There are things that you can do, stress testing or load testing all online. That's a possibility. And I'll just mention them in case we don't, when we talk about the kind of legal stuff, there is something which I start to use a bit more, which is the wave.webaim.org, which is a website which you can actually get in one of the extensions. I always use the developer toolbar, yeah. and it's yeah. one of those in there, which will give you, uh, it will highlight some accessibility issues. But again, as with all of these tools, um, it can come up with some false positives, and it can miss things as well. Yeah, And there is also for free, which I... Uh, downloading I use now is um, NVDA, which is the non visual desktop access screen reader, entirely free. So I will put both of those in the show notes so that we know mm. we know we can get them. But yeah, I think the Wave one is one that's been highlighted to me by accessibility people such as Amber Hines and so on. So definitely worth checking it out. And you just literally either install it as an extension and it will give you yeah. helpful tips on the fly. Or I believe you can. Um, oh no, I think it is just an extension. I didn't. I was no. I think you can put an address in when you go to the website yes. as well, and it will give you the same data. But you'll have to actually reach out as opposed to the the extension giving you that data on the fly. Okay, are we done? I think we are. Okay, what's next? Oh, that's a very good question. Let me just have a look at our notes. So we're talking about third party add ons. So we'll have a chat about. Uh, chat add-ons, newsletters, pop-ups, that kind of thing. Oh, Things this, that we might be this could literally go on for years, yeah. It could, um, couldn't it? Okay, episode four, we'll get to that in a couple of weeks' time. Nice to chat, David. Yeah, I enjoyed that. Thanks. Bye. Well, I hope that you enjoyed that. Always a pleasure chatting to my friend David Wormsley. If you've got anything to say, head over to wpbuilds.com, search for episode number 285 and leave us a comment. Alternatively, go to our Facebook group, wpbuilds.com forward slash Facebook. Over 3,100 very polite, I stress that, very polite and friendly WordPressers giving you useful tips and tricks and commentary. The WP Builds podcast was brought to you today by GoDaddy Pro. GoDaddy Pro, the home of managed WordPress hosting that includes free domain, SSL and 24-7 support. Bundle that with The Hub by GoDaddy Pro to unlock more free benefits to manage multiple sites in one place. Invoice clients and get 30% off new purchases. You can find out more by going to go.me forward slash WP Builds. And we do thank GoDaddy Pro for their support and helping us to put on the WP Builds podcast. Okay, we'll be back next Thursday for what is probably going to be an interview episode. As I said, we'll be around doing our This Week in WordPress live show, wpbuilds.com forward slash live on a Monday, 2 p.m. UK time. And it'll come out again as a podcast the following day. I hope that you enjoyed that. Like I said, leave us a comment. Go and rate us on iTunes and all of that good stuff. And I'm going to fade in some cheesy music, as I do every week, and say, stay safe. Bye-bye for now. Bye-bye for now.